So today I want to talk to you about induction. A lot of people see this as kind of a magic and why does it even work? So let's start with the example, you know, something very, very classic. So one is just one. One plus two is three. One plus two plus three is six. One plus two plus three plus four is 10. You can continue this, or maybe you know the formula that one plus all the way up to n equals n squared plus n divided by two. So if n equals one, we're just summing one, that's one plus one divided by two, that's fine. If n equals two, we have four plus two, that's six divided by two, that's three. If we have n equals three, this is nine plus three, that's 12 divided by two, six. So how can we prove that this is always the case? Classic example, perhaps one of the few uh, uh, canonical examples of proof by induction. So how do you do this? You say, well, this is my conjecture and I'm gonna prove it like this. I'm gonna say base case, right, the induction base, we prove this for n equals one. So for n equal one, I'm just gonna verify by hand. So for n equal one, we have one is one squared plus one divided by two, that's two divided by two, that's one. We already had this discussion over there. Excellent. So now, you know, if you're in high school, maybe this is how you were taught. Uh, you write down the induction hypothesis. And when I was in school, we were taught you have to write it like this. Uh, because this is the magic. They don't explain why it works, they just tell you what to write to get the marks. So the induction hypothesis is that this thing is true for n. So the induction hypothesis is that this sum up to n, where n is some given number, equals that. And now, the induction step, we're going to assume the hypothesis and prove this for n plus one. So now we want to sum all the way up to n plus one. So what, what is this? This is all the summation up to n, and then again, this one extra bit of term. The hypothesis I have made is that this bit equals to that, because this is what we assume. So we can replace these two terms. So this equals n squared plus n divided by two, and I still have this n plus one. So this becomes n squared plus n plus two n plus two divided by two, which becomes n squared plus three n plus two divided by two. And well, I know the answer to this because we know what we're trying to prove, but you can verify that this is indeed n plus one square plus n plus one divided by two. One way to do this is to open the parenthesis here and sum all of this and you can check that we can do that. So now we said, okay, so we have proved that the sum up to n plus one also has the same form as this, right? Instead of n, we have n plus one. The conclusion is that the identity hold for all natural n. That's a conclusion. That's how we prove that this is always true. Because it always works for the next one. Exactly. So wh what's the idea here? It's exactly what you said. I'm starting at one, and then I'm gonna keep going one step at a time. And somehow by just proving these two things, I managed to prove infinitely many things. There are infinitely many natural numbers, right? If you now say, I'm gonna plug five billion into this, then instead of summing all of this, you know, there's just this small formula, right? The, the uh, general urban legend with, I um, don't have the reference off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's debunked. Uh, it's that Gauss, when he was like five or seven or something, his school teacher told the kids, oh, sum all the numbers from one to a hundred. And he came up with this formula and finished like that. Uh, fairly sure this is thoroughly debunked. <laughs> We've set our number file, but all right. <laughs> well, you know, there's a half-life for uh, uh, factoids. Um, Tell me why you said induction is magical. So this is kind of clear. Let's do something 
where it's not at all clear. Let's prove that every natural number greater than 1 has a prime divisor. So naturally, you want to prove this for all the natural numbers. So I'm going to say, well, um, let's do it by induction. Let's, for 1, there's nothing to check for 1 because we excluded it you know, purposefully. Also for 0, again, excluded purposefully. So we can check it for 2, can check it for 3, can check it for 4, and so on and so on. But now, if you look at what we just did with the base and the step, if I tell you that 5 has a prime divisor, which is 5, how is this going to help you find what prime divides 6? Right? We know what prime divides, it's 2 and 3. But the only hypothesis you've had is that 5 has a prime divisor. So what do we do now? Well, now we turn to something that's called strong induction or complete induction, which has a much, uh, my, much more mind-boggling kind of uh, hypothesis. So if n is greater than 1, then n has a prime divisor. This is what we want to show. So my induction hypothesis now, strong induction, I'm going to call it, is going to be if every k less than n has a prime divisor, n has a prime divisor. So I'm not just assuming in the case of 6, 5 and 6, I'm not just assuming 5 has a prime divisor. I'm saying 2, 3, 4 and 5 have prime divisors, let me show that 6 has one. So the proof, kind of silly at this point, so this is the induction step. So I'm assuming this up to n, whatever n was, and I have two cases now. Case 1, maybe n is a prime number. If it's a prime number, it divides itself. We're done. Right? Then, as mathematicians like to say, trivially, n has a prime divisor. By definition almost. By definition, exactly. This is the point of trivially. Right? What happens if it's not a prime number? So, in this case, by the virtue of it not being prime, there are, let's say, k and m such that k times m equals n. In the case of 6, this would be 2 times 3. Right. Does that have to be two numbers? Like, do we already know that it can only be built from two numbers? Or? Well, it can be from any, any numbers, but you can group them together into two bits. The important thing is, because n is not prime, it's not only that there are two numbers, I'm also in the position to require and both k and m are smaller than n. Because if n was prime, one of those had to be 1 and the other had to be n. But because n is not prime, that means exactly I can find two smaller numbers whose product is n. Now, Look at the uh, induction hypothesis. So, all the numbers before. Exactly. In particular, k, which is a smaller number. So there is a prime p, which divides k. Right? So, k equals p times k prime. But that means n is m times k, which is m times k prime times p. So now p is a divisor of n. So we found a prime divisor. Now, a lot of people struggle with this because you've been taught about induction. You start with a base case and you keep working upwards. There was no base case. There was a secret base case. Every time you see induction, and for that matter, every time you see recursion, there is a concept called well-foundedness which is lurking in the background. And the idea of well-foundedness, in a nutshell, is that you have some kind of ordering that relates objects, numbers, functions, whatever. And whenever you look at a collection of them, there's a smallest one. So, but smallest one in that order. This is important. All right, so the natural numbers, this is the defining property. If I tell you, all the numbers, you know, between uh, 100 and 1000, which are prime numbers. There's a smallest prime number in that collection, right? We know there is one, at least, and, you know, 
Why do we know that's a different story? But we know there's one, and so there's the smallest one. Right? If I tell you uh, the power, the smallest power of two between a billion and a Googleplex, we know there's the smallest number of two. This is exactly this. Whenever you have induction, especially these kind of complete inductions, there's some kind of a relation hiding which is well founded. In the case of uh, prime division, what we have is the divisibility relation. So let's say that uh, n divides m, this is the notation. Now on the natural numbers, if you look at the natural numbers, it's very easy to show that there's a smallest one in any non-empty collection according to this relation because it kind of connects with the standard ordering of the natural number. But the secret is the smallest objects here in this relation are the prime numbers because they have nothing below them except themselves. And so this induction is really saying look at this division relation. So we have, uh, let's vaguely draw how it looks like. We have one which is at the very bottom and we're going to ignore that for now because we only look at things which are greater than one. Above one we have all the prime, two and three and five and seven and you know, 37 and whatever. And now you have four which is this and six and nine and 10 and 25 and uh, 15 here, you know, all, all of those things, 24 and all, it, it gives you this kind of relation. And what you're doing here is saying, look at the base case. The base case, this one part, is all the prime numbers. This is trivially true. And then when you continue upwards, if you look down from 24, it has a prime divisor below it. This is the whole point of being well-founded. You look at all the divisors, there's the smallest one. And this is exactly being prime. So this could be argued that this proof really checks that this relation is well-founded on the natural numbers, or the other way around, that if you have proved that this relation is well-founded on the natural numbers, which you can in other ways, you have proved that every number has a prime divisor. You see, there's a lot of examples of induction and recursion, and they all work on this. For example, uh, if you don't mind me going a little bit into programming, uh, let's talk about the factorial argument. So, how do you compute the factorial of 3? 3 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3. That happened to be 6. And 4 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, which is 24. And n plus 1 factorial is n factorial times n plus 1 in general. Uh, let's say you want to write a Python code you know, to, to program for this. The natural thing is to just have some kind of recursive thing. You start by saying, okay, if n equals 1, it's two terms 1, otherwise call the function with the previous number. The runtime on this is fairly easy to compute. It's n steps, right? Let's say you want to put a thousand factorial and you haven't done any adjustments to your software settings or whatnot. Uh, Python will throw an error because it has a stack limit of a thousand. So if it goes a thousand functions in, it says this is too much, I can't do this anymore. Let's define a different recursive function. Instead of saying just compute the last one, look at the whole interval from 1 to n and then say split it in the middle, right, with whatever, if it's an odd number either way. If and take the product of this entire interval. So if this is just one number, it's just the one number. Otherwise, you multiply, what do you do? You split this one in half and you take these two. And you split this one in half and take these two. And you keep splitting. This gives you kind of a binary search. 
what you end up with is that, uh, let's say we wanted to compute, you know, a 24 factorial. This is pretty big, I'm not gonna <laughs> even remotely try to do this. But it first does 1 to 12 and 13 to 24. And then here it says, oh, I want to compute this product of all of these numbers. I'm gonna do 1 to 6 and 7 to 12. And here I'm gonna do 1 to 3 and 4 to 6, and then 1 to 2, and just 3. And now 3 is just itself, and this is split into 1 and 2, and then you take the computation of those two, and you put it here, and this is just the one thing, so you go back up here. Again, this is split into 4 times 5 and 6, and then 4 and 5, and you start going back and what you do is you go down in the tree and you start going back up and, and you know, computing over the branches. At no point in this tree of, of recursion, you've been more than one, two, three, four, five steps deep. Much better than 24 steps deep. If you compute how it looks like if you take a thousand, you're gonna find out that you're only something like 10 steps deep. The, the use is so much better of, of time and space. But what we're doing here is we're looking at the binary tree and we're saying, well, this tree is well-founded because it's finite, it has to be. So we can do recursion on the tree. This is the structure where you define the recursion on. Just like in the proof with the prime numbers, we actually had some secret structure where we did the induction on that. And if you think about all of the induction arguments as being there's some structure there and it's doing something to make it easier or harder and maybe it can take a different structure, that allows you to come up with new and inventive algorithms and induction arguments in all manner of places in mathematics and programming and whatnot. And, uh, it took me so many years to really get to the bottom of this. And this is so amazing. And when you talk to other mathematicians, you know, proof by induction is kind of magic. You just do the one, you do the step, you get everything. How does that happen? This is how it happens. It's about well-foundedness. Doing induction or not induction, it's up to us. And I want to demonstrate here Two cases of induction. If I press the first domino, all right, wasn't perfect, but you got the point. So it's a bag containing a bag containing nothing. Okay. Right. So all numbers are just bags of nothing. It's just how many nothings have you got? Kind of. 